Thank you for coming. Thank you for accepting our uh, invitation. <laughs> I am Maria Paula Fernandez. I've been in blockchain for a while. Now I uh, co-founder a protocol called uh, JPEG. I also co-founder and uh, co-founded the Department of Decentralization, which was the entity that uh, created in Berlin and started researching quite early into NFTs. And through my journey around, I met team first as a hacker and a collaborator for one of the events. I met Bea as well because Bea has been around for such a long time supporting artists uh, from New York uh, to the world. And of course, uh, I met Adina and with Adina we started uh, working on an essay around NFT infrastructure and the origins of it. And we're going to publish it uh, also together with Simon and Danny. We're going to publish it for... What am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> Oh, okay. But you hear me, right? Yes. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we started working on an NFT essay uh, that's called On Building. And we're going to publish it together with uh, Simon Denny for the NFT Tashin book, which is, you know, like the Tashin books are these really large, expensive books that normally list all the things that are happening in a particular moment in time in art. So uh, we thought about bringing the participants of NFT history to this stage and tell you more about it. Um, maybe a round, quick round of intros? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm Adina Glickstein. As MP mentioned, we're working together on an essay about the infrastructural history of NFTs. Um, with a particular interest in the way that the ecosystem developed, um, in part out of innovation uh, that predated the term NFT. So before the establishment of the ERC-721 token around 2017 and 2018. And we're kind of interested in this like moment of its, um, of its formalization as a token standard and the different forms that might have anticipated it um, in Bitcoin 2.0 or other different registry services tied to the blockchain that um, did sort of NFT thinking before the NFT as a form uh, that we know it today. And that's how I started working with MP. Um, we also connected last fall. Uh, I'm an editor at large at Spike Art Magazine and worked on the Web3 issue, um, which came out in winter of 2021. So that's my background. Um, yeah. Uh, introduction. Um, yeah. All right. So, hey, uh, I'm Beatrice. I uh, was originally the founder and creator of Data. Um, it's a platform where people speak to each other through drawings. There's nothing really like it in, in the world online or, or you really like uh, have a conversation. Um, so we started in 2014 and uh, created this beautiful community and the question was how do we monetize? Um, and we were, you know, figuring out all these revenue models. We were a startup and we knew that anything that we were uh, any revenue model or any business model will destroy the community. And so we were looking for solutions. And in 2017, I read about decentralized uh, applications. I'm a, I was a, a, a very capitalist uh, in practice, but I was an anarchist in, in my soul. So it was like, okay, this is the way. And uh, found Roy Peppers and thought that, okay, so th there's a, there's a, there's something here that is interesting. Back then, the, the ethos of blockchain were very idealistic. And so we just like went into it, created, the, launched the Groups and Weirdos, which is one of the first uh, collections in the Ethereum blockchain, right after CryptoPunks, before the CryptoKitties. And, uh, and well, then, since then, it's been an, an incredible journey. Uh, yeah, that's a, a little bit of my background. Yeah, good morning. I'm uh, Tim Daubenschütz. I started working at um, a company called Ascribe in 2015 here in Berlin. And we were doing uh, basically art registration, so we were anchoring uh, patches of artworks onto the Bitcoin blockchain. Uh, and we were like trying to figure out like what, what this all meant, where were the, you know, the benefits of doing that, and we were also speaking. Uh, people in the space, I think um, uh, among, me, among some of them were you, Beatri Beatrix. And um, yeah, so 
we ended up actually pivoting our uh, the, the company to big chain DB and today it's called it's still around and it's called uh, the the ocean protocol it has its own token um, yeah but I guess uh, it's probably interesting um, kind of to hear how, what what we were thinking back then uh, yeah also um, maybe I I, should, I I shouldn't say it for you but uh, he's behind the hottest trend as well in the space right now, soulbound tokens that yesterday oh, yeah. remain renamed again. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was not. Very yeah, hot. so so uh, <laughs> I think recently Vitalik and um, others came out with a new paper called the Decentralized Society. So I've been also involved in that and specifically in kind of configurable properties. So for example, soulbound tokens, accountbound tokens, and like yeah, uh, I think now we also have a standard for namebound tokens. So. This is all I've found here. <laughs> Just, okay, um, so thank you, Tim. Um, very excited to have you all here. And I think, so uh, basically with the format that we have, Adina's gonna moderate and ask all the hard questions, but I'm gonna also ask Adina about our essay because uh, she has been heading most of the research and some of the angles that we have covered uh, are going to inform the questions that we're going to ask uh, Tim and Bea. So, uh, yeah, the first thing that uh, we started researching is about the name that we were proposed for the, for the essay. That's called Unbuilding. So for me that I've been working, uh, you know, since a while in blockchain, uh, now that everyone uh, talks about building, I remember the first time in 2018 when we were entering the bear market and uh, East Denver was there and everyone was like, oh my God, build, because that's sort of like the escapist against, uh, you know, the fact that we are going to enter a very, uh, a very long bear. And also notoriously in during that hackathon, it was when the ERC-721 uh, ERC standard uh, flourished and started formalizing. So uh, building connects to that, but it also connects to a big crying rally, if we can call it in a way, from uh, now VC and uh, Netscape co-founder Mark Andreessen when he called people to build a uh, as a critique towards what was going on in the world with the advent of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we have been researching on that angle. And the first thing that we actually started talking about was about a very old essay that <laughs> Adina unearthed on a, the reshuffling of art critic towards a, a, a more materiality in the critic. And a, yeah, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I come from an art world background and stepping into the research process to write an essay about the infrastructural history of NFTs um, with this title that we were handed on building uh, to me felt kind of like aggrandizing when we think about the way that new infrastructures come into existence. This notion that um, like individual founders are like a wellspring of new ideas comes forth from their genius brains uh, felt a bit challenging to me and we were interested in approaching this idea of building in a more collaborative way or in a way that might actually reflect the way that new developments in the Ethereum ecosystem take place um, such that it's somehow more community driven um, and also the idea that in that space critique is like a positive act of uh, creating new possibility spaces. So in approaching this research, I actually came across uh, an essay by Lucy Lepard and John Chandler from 1968. Uh, and around this time, Lepard, who was uh, an art critic, uh, was describing the immaterial turn uh, or the turn towards conceptualism in visual art. And um, with this turn towards what she calls in this essay, uh, hyper-conceptual art, or essentially works that, um, while they had a material form, uh, were more about the written materials that framed them or the theoretical backing that they held than the way that they looked, uh, to you know, speak really reductively about that movement. Um, that when the art becomes more immaterial, the role of critique becomes more material. Uh, and way back in 1968, you know, this seminal art critic uh, essentially redefined the role of criticism after the conceptual turn as the responsibility to actively posit 
new possibilities uh, for the world that you're building in, which sounds a lot like this Mark Andreessen blog post from um, the beginning of the pandemic, it's time to build. And the resonance between those two things really struck me. So we took this idea of um, building and iterating not as uh, necessarily like a motivated individual redefining things on your own, but rather as like a gesture of creating new possibilities through, uh, ref um, through a community uh, or in, in an online forum space, for instance, in the case of some of these Ethereum developments that we're talking about as like the, the ways in which new infrastructures come into existence. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, this brings us to a Bea that has been building and you know making things better in the, and following the same sort of line of thought. Um, Adina, you had the questions. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> um, part part of this emphasis on building has taken us towards this seminal moment in 2017, 2018, sort of around the time that the ERC 721 token standard was. Um, coming into existence. And Bea, this is when Dada started, right? So could you tell us a little bit more about what you were doing around that time and how you were thinking about NFTs um, in this moment of their inception? Um, uh, for me, I, I, we never really were thinking about NFTs. Uh, for me, the interesting thing about blockchain technology was the possibility of the token economy from the start of a decentralized community, of decentralized governance. And so we stumbled upon the NFTs because we were an art platform. Um, and as an art platform, what we did was when we launched the Crypto and Weirdos was the first decentralized um, our marketplace uh, on Ethereum way before, um, like six months or eight months before Super Rare and, and Known Origin. And what we did was uh, to think in terms of art and the artists, because before us, there were artists doing their own things, and there were communities like there were Pepe's, you know, mean communities, there were, but there were not communities of artists. And so when we launched the Crips and Weirdos, what we did was immediately include royalties into the smart contracts. It was the first time that automated uh, royalties were coded because we were artists. Everything else was a company launching a P, you know, as what we know now as a PFP or uh, decentralized communities. So for us, that was important. In, in the way we did the royalties, it was already very, very much towards a change in the paradigm. So it was 40% on the profit will go to 30% uh, to the artist and 10% to a fund for the entire community. That was already uh, what we could see as something that, that was um, a, a, lo a lot of steps away from, from what we knew. Now, four years, uh, five years almost later, we have a completely different view. Um, we actually are, are, like, uh, are beyond royalties, we're anti-royalties now because it doesn't make sense in a speculative market. Um, it doesn't make sense because really the wealth is transferred from the artist to the collectors, or the collectors are the ones who are uh, building wealth. So you can think of it, in, in, you can think of it the opposite, like there's a 10% standard of royalties that was actually hard fought to be able to, in, to, to make it a standard, but I see it as a, the artist transferring 90% of the wealth to the collectors. And so, and, and, and there's a big argument where I've done a lot of analysis, analysis about it. And probably around this year, collectors as a group are gonna be building more wealth than, than artists as a group. So the entire uh, ecosystem has become what we were supposed to be fighting back then in 2017. And so, that's, yeah. So, so for me, that what we were thinking, it was really change. Change in the paradigm, I don't see that happening today, but we are changing it. We're doing something completely different. Yeah, I think that's a, a perfect answer because it really exemplifies uh, the degree to which a lot of the uh, innovations in this ecosystem that like with historical um, perspective we see as so prescient and having anticipated some of the most important developments in NFTs today, we're also artist led. Uh, which brings us perhaps nicely to Ascribe. Tim, can you talk a little bit more about what Ascribe was, what yeah, you did? Sure. Um, yeah, actually, so I started my job in 2015 in May, and I was, uh, front, I was um, employed as a front-end developer, and so actually we had to come up 
kind of with the first interface for like digital art or whatever. And so for, for us, that was the challenge. We had kind of like nowhere to look to understand how any of these uh, things should, should look like, how they should work, how, like what, were, what, what is even the concept of an artwork? How are people like making art? Like, you know, is it one thing? Is it many things? There's like this terminology of the legal terminology of, cre of creations and manifestations and so on. And so we ended up actually, since we didn't really focus on the aspect of monetization and uh, not at all f finalization at uh, finance, financization at all we we ended up um, very pretty much like iterating with artists on something like a user interface uh, then we in 2015 i think no there was no good resources for example what it for what it meant to anchor or timestamp your art also it was kind of not really well understood that what this claim would would give you or what would would be the purpose of that and so we had i think a lot of our work was education and like just communicating basically our, our <laughs> idea. And so we also, I think within the company, we, we ended up understanding that we had to pivot, I think, uh, uh, like in the beginning of 2016. And so we did that and I was part of the team that kind of like kept the, the lights running at Ascribe where other people already started working on the pivot of Big Chain DB. And so the Ascribe team, what we actually did is we said, okay, we want to generalize actually this, um, this ownership layer we just had to had like previously written in Python. And so we came up with a, uh, a, li a licensing framework where basically the, the within copyright law and licensing law uh, and in collaboration with a lawyer that we were working with uh, like this a colleague of, was, was a colleague of mine back then, uh, we ended up coming up uh, with a standard called Koala IP. And then kind of at the same time when even the people were withdrawn that were keeping on the lights at Ascribe, I think uh, the NFT space in Ethereum and Ethereum came up and just like, to me, Ethereum just exploded into the space because you hadn't known it before at all. And then suddenly everything was Ethereum. Um, so we kind of, so when people started like uploading, I think the first real um, use case was CryptoKitties. So when people started uploading like these baseball cards slash uh, Pokemon card style of collections, uh, I think a lot of people within Ascribe, for example, also t like were re very frustrated and took kind of offense in that because we were working so long on like figuring out our thing somehow and then someone else came along and just like <laughs> made it perfect or whatever or made it work yeah. so it was kind of funny and and we ended up always having this so i i ended up working even longer on koala ip and i tried to like retrofit this like legal framework into nfts and i ended up stop stopping to do that i think a uh, few years like few years ago but later tim back back then there was also the problem of bitcoin being too expensive no mm. that's also why everybody was working on ethereum cheaper exactly at the time. so so we were talking with uh, some art institutions back then and i, I think we had um, like this this uk um, uh, like ip management uh, company that wanted to just like dump their whole catalog of uh, artworks onto the Bitcoin blockchain just to have them anchored. And, and so the problem was that back then, also in 2016, the block wars, scaling wars happened. And so it was kind of contested, for example, that you are even supposed to write something in the OP return, uh, in the OP return field of a transaction. They were like, I, I remember seeing a IRC conversation, you know, very long conversation with someone just like ranting about how bad we are at the scribe for like registering, you know, putting these hashes into the OP return. And that is like uh, kind of more morally uh, challenging because, you know, everyone has to uh, continue to, you know, store this, this uh, data of the registered works and so on. So, yeah, so that, but that was the motivation why we ended up pivoting also to right. blockchain to be, yes, to scale blockchain, blockchains. Yeah. Yeah. So that's actually perhaps a really good point that I think is really worth dwelling on for a second, is that one of the really interesting things about Ascribe is that it um, sort of foresaw a way to write smart contracts, but on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, and one of the questions that we've been getting into in our research is why the NFT ecosystem um, exploded so successfully 
on Ethereum and so many sort of early attempts towards creating tokenized art projects used Bitcoin and used it in really ingenious ways, um, but often couldn't quite take off for reasons that were both technological, but also maybe social and political as some of these IRC chats <laughs> suggest. Um, and so maybe this is something that all three of you could get into a little bit is um, what, what do you see as like the technological affordances um, beyond just the obvious fact that Ethereum enables smart contracts in a way that Bitcoin doesn't, that allow this NFT ecosystem to, um, to grow there as opposed to on Bitcoin or other uh, early blockchains? It was easy. It was super easy. I mean, we got, we got into, into blockchain in June. I went to the first Ethereum summit. I was blown away. That day we say, we're going on, you know, we're doing this. Um, by August, I learned about CryptoPunks. We talked to them, we took their smart contract, they helped us, you know, we modified their smart contract and just launched in by September, we already had the, so it was easy for, you know, when you come into this new ecosystem, especially back then, nobody understood anything, it took you a long time to, so it was easy and also I think, I mean, this is, it's also interesting because back then, I remember people will not, and I think this is a problem still today, uh, people did not understand the difference between what was happening before, for instance, what you guys were doing in registering art and NF and what CryptoPunks did. What CryptoPunks did to me was a turning point because uh, basically it was about what we call back then digital scarcity, making it probably rare. So now is the token the image attached to that token, what becomes probably rare, which is not the same as registering on the blockchain. It's like an evolution to that. And I think that's what kicks, you know, that's what makes CryptoKitties uh, do the project. And so before that, you had projects even in Ethereum, like, crypt, like, like Corio Cards or Rare Peppers, where, where had, uh, the image had one contract that made it unique. But then uh, the additions are actually fungible. They're fungible tokens. CryptoPunks was the first, I think, that made every uh, image a uh, unique token back then. Then we did the same. We, I think we were the first one, I think, that made additions unique uh, because we took the CryptoPunks as smart contracts and made every edition uh, with a print, a print ID uh, index. And then came the standard. So the standard made it super easy after crypto oh, kitties. Everybody was doing projects. Uh, for I think, talking, uh, maybe, yeah. um, I think uh, tying up on onto the scarcity um, discussion, which was you know one of the main value propositions when I came to learn about NFTs. One of them was uh, obviously the use case around authenticity and provenance that has been later resurfaced by uh, Christi uh, Christine Paul um, for a data curator at the Whitney Museum and has uh, created a really nice article on, you know, this uh, notion of NFTs being uh, augmented uh, certificates of authenticity, which no, is, uh, you know, it's limited. It's, it's, it's limited, limited, but it's a fantastic use case. It's easy to communicate. It's a great use case, but yeah, but it's but, I, but it's I not get, the definition of an I get NFT. It, uh, yeah, I get I get it, but it's one of the ways that you're able to penetrate that world and be politically correct because it's a game of politics in the end. But it's but, problematic because people are getting their own idea. It's not like I, I we went to Florence recently and there was a an exhibition yeah. they had descriptions of what is an nft what is minting yeah. and what is an nft was uh basically a certificate so of authenticity for people no no but, but but hold on one second and then what's minting is the act of uh making a certificate of authenticity mm -hmm. authenticity they don't even talk about the token so it's i don't think it's, it serves anyone to um, it's like it's lack of understanding right. of the technology. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you and also disagree with you because I think that any <laughs> way to get our message across is valid because then people start biting more into it and then before you know it, they're minting things at 5 a.m. Um, no, but, but there's a problem with that and I tell guys, you what's the problem. I, but can I finish? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very passionate about this point. Yeah. So, you know, there's, you know, those were the two, you know, early value propositions. Um, and uh, of course, you know, what worked, uh, what really made it penetrate uh, the Ethereum community uh, 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 that didn't really quite make it to other blockchains and especially Bitcoin is that A, um, 
the communication around it. Uh, the communication was really simplified. So that ties to your point that it was something so easy to grasp for people that they, uh, and you know, the fact that, you know, we tied it to uh, collectibles was also very effective because, you know, that's, you know, a human, te there's a human tendency to collect for hobbies. So that responded as well. And uh, together with that, to, uh, with that sort of like narrative and communication, of course, there's uh, also the question that uh, the Ethereum community is more playful and it's more open and they don't see Ethereum either. Well, some of them do, but I don't care about them. Uh, they don't see Ethereum as A, a store of value or B, a P2P uh, transaction system, which are, you know, the two things about Bitcoin. They see Ethereum as an extendable and a playground, an extendable play, play, playground for any kind of application. Um, and, you know, like, of course, you know, there's uh, some very in, in strong use cases, but Ethereum is for everyone and Ethereum is for all. And that particular, uh, uh, that particular ethos translated into the art world, uh, you know, the, and the emerging uh, NFT crypto artist and made, made it, you know, possible for us to say now it was so easy. No, but it wasn't easy uh, communication. That, that's not what I meant. It was actually really, really hard to understand. What was easy was as develop for developers to develop, but for people to understand that was impossible mm -hmm. back then. Um, the problem with what you're saying is after th this idea that it needs to be easy, that it needs to be easy for people to understand, that we need to onboard a billion people into the blockchain, make something like OpenSea, Basically, something that is not blockchain is Web2. It's yeah. a centralized company. It doesn't, I mean, you, you think that you're minting, but you're not minting. They're lying, basically, mm -hmm. because they're not being straight to people. That's the problem. And, and who cares about the art world? I mean, the whole point is to basically to say, well, we can create new paradigms. We can create something different. Artists didn't come. The art world didn't come in 2017 or 2018. Mm -hmm. They came after people sold, and yeah. so uh, so that tells you a lot about their world. So uh, I don't think that we have to make it easy to them. I think actually for artists, if we talk about artists, I, we always say artists need to understand the technology because mm -hmm. that's what gives you power. Mm -hmm. Understanding the technology and not depending on, all, <laughs> on, on some platforms that are designing everything for you are just to buy and sell, understanding the technology, using it as a medium, that's what gives you power. Absolutely, but you need translators. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you need translators. I, you know, I've been working with protocols for a while and I don't wish anyone to have to learn in the way that I did from the CTO being like, very nasty <laughs> because I didn't understand something. You need translators. That's what I mean with communication. You know, communication is key. And I think that even in its very early grassroots ways, you know, with John standing with an iPad uh, on hackathons for Super Rare and others, you know, we were doing it in the best way that we could, but, you know, making sure that people, you know, accessed it already. It was really hard because, you know, the infrastructure sucked. It, it continues to suck, but at least, you know, people are, you know, becoming less scared of uh, playing with it. But, you know, we were there, you know, we were the translators, you, me, uh, and, you know, many others. And that's, uh, you know, that's quite important as well. I actually think that there is no justification for the wrong definitions of NFT today. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I hate it here. Yeah, lately. So, so a certificate of authenticity describing an NFT just as that is, is problematic. But anyway. Yeah, but <laughs> I, I also think, by the way, that, um, that do I need this? No, right? No. Uh, <laughs> uh, that I, I think an NFT. If, when you come from the from the context, uh, from my background, I think uh, at a scribe, the for us the certificate of authenticity was a PDF you could download on our website after you <laughs> kind of registered the artwork, and yeah. we were we and the artists we were kind of like together vouching that the certificate was authentic. So, um, so I, I actually I don't see NFTs as uh, like coming back to your point. I don't see them as certificates of, of authenticity. Actually, I see them probably as 
uh, financial instruments. So really, I think what is happening is that you are. A I, I mean, some yeah. some of the some some of, some of the most popular people in the space, like Simon de la Rouvier, you know, they are suggesting, for example, that you release your NFTs under the Creative Commons Zero license, so no attribution whatsoever. So basically, it's more that you know we are there is this uh, concept of copyright and licensing. We're just gonna push it aside. It's irrelevant now. And we are creating kind of this uh, financial primitive or financial instrument, basically, that people, they kind of, I, I guess they understand b because they know, like, for example, how stock markets work or I think in Ethereum, they know how Ethereum and Bitcoin, and Bitcoin works and so on. So I think people are able to translate kind of from... from but it's problematic too, though. Very yeah. problematic too. Well, I don't know. Okay, so the problem with making uh, NFTs just a financial instrument, which is what they are, it's not about the art, it's not about, it's about the token, uh, it means that now, yes, I'm completely pro, uh, we have an incredible opportunity to completely redefine, and I've talked a lot with Primavera about it, yeah. the going beyond creative commons, because now you can trace everyone, now you can say who contributed to something, it's going to be in the, in, on chain forever, and if there is, you know, in the 15 iteration, it's all by a lot of money, it goes back to everyone. We can do that technology, but instead, because it's becoming a financial instrument, the copyright is going to the collector. And so the collector now can do whatever they want with the image, with the, is their token, is there, they can do, they can make tons of money, and not the artist. The no, it's not protecting the artist, it's not protecting the creator, it's protecting the owner of the token. And so it's extremely problematic because now they're figuring out ways of how do I send, transfer the IP of the artist to the owner of the token, which is what happens in the, in the normal world. You work for Disney, you lose all your intellectual property. The whole point of making royalties on, the, on, on, on NFTs was precisely to protect artists from that. But now we're going back into the old ways because it's a financial instrument. I, I agree with both of you. Um, you know, the thing is that uh, now that NFTs uh, have gone ma mainstream, whether we like it or not, they can be everything. They can be financial instruments, they can be certificates of authenticity, they can be they a can way be to listen, re yeah. redistribute wealth and ensure as well that there's a fair art uh, market uh, for creatives. There, they can be so many things. Of course, you know, right now the attention is put on like a particular thing, but there's people that are building infrastructure like, you know, you, Bea, and, uh, you know, I'm building infrastructure for curation, um, which has nothing to do with the financialization, but probably it's going to help order the mess that you see on OpenSea. And it's going to help as well, you know, with, you know, creating some kind of like stratification of the space where people, uh, you know, are no longer dictating what's cool because they own it and that pumps their bags. Um, so there's really everything right now. And, you know, on the risk of sounding like a capitalist, which I sort of am, um, I like the exposure to finance uh, that artists have. I don't like the acceleration that's happening right now. And I don't think that's, uh, that's good. Uh, but I do like uh, artists using financial instruments. I do like them as well, experimenting with them and using financial instruments as a medium. So, you know, just like reducing NFTs to one particular category before, uh, before understanding their highly versatile assets uh, or, you know, objects and they're part of culture as anything on Ethereum, um, that's, you know, a little bit where the, where the conflict is, where, you know, there should be no conflict. There's one for everyone. It's just that we need, Well, you know. no, not necessarily, though, because mm -hmm. the whole point of non-fungible tokens is that they're non-fungible. So if you only look at it as a certificate of authenticity, you're missing the probably rare aspect mm -hmm. of it. And so this is, a, this is problematic because you have platforms, I think, make, make uh, space is still fungible. It's not even a, a mm -hmm. an, an NFT. But people need to understand the difference. Otherwise, we keep messing up, you know, yeah. building all this like really bad technology that doesn't serve whoever is using it. But how, how do we use? Uh, how do we go back to the scarcity when we're basically on, you know, on the grand scheme of things, NFTs are basically postcards assets. You know, there's like. 
tens of thousands uh, being born every day. So where's like, how can we translate that idea of scarcity when, you know, the market is printing constantly? Because I, to me, I don't see it as a scarcity. That's something that the market values, but mm -hmm. it's completely manufactured. For me, what is interesting is the, uh, the idea of the uniqueness is unique. And unique doesn't necessarily mean scarce or vice versa. So that's what an NFT does to me. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and that's what is important. So on that, you have the attribution and you have the, the possibility of, you know, the transactional, you have the financial, you have all of that. But that is the thing that makes it different from anything else that uh, was before or after, right? And so, mm -hmm. If you think about real estate and the use case for NFTs, then, you know, it's like if you have a building and then you have a token for each uh, apartment, but each apartment is different. And so how you need an NFT can be just the title. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's what I think is important to remember. Yeah, yeah and I, I think the, I guess the scarcity aspect I guess it's also kind of weird because essentially with Ascribe, for example, we also had like scarce artworks, like there was only one of a kind registered on the Bitcoin blockchain and then like the UI was practically exactly the same with like minor differences on like for example OpenSea, but I think people did not perceive the scarce uh, aspect, like only very few immediately understood because and, and, and we, I think at the time, you know, there was a lot of conversation within a Stripe, for example, if you want to uh, add a Stripe integration or that you can buy the artworks with Bitcoin. And we were just like so busy doing all of the other things uh, that it also, I think, never really happened. But um, so, yeah, it, it was kind of challenging because we didn't feel that it was like even I as an employee, I think, didn't really feel that something was scarce, even though, you know, there was like works from Harm Funded Open, which even back then were amazing, uploaded to a scribe. Um, and, and then, you know, we had this one, I think, pivotal moment at a scribe where uh, someone from New York, 23 Rivi, I don't know if you, uh, I, I also forgot the person's name, but what they started doing is um, selling a scribe artworks on like a small website and they put a price tag on it and they sold like, we weren't present, but what this person told us is that it, like people went nuts for that. Like they sold these editions in like no time, but at that time already a scribe had like kind of failed. So there was no mm -hmm. further action. So the point I'm trying to make, I think is that scarcity is uh, very much somehow connected to pricing things and to like putting a price a tag to it. I think this is vital for the understanding because other things are like, for example, the the board a, a yard club. I mean, these things are not scarce. There's like 10,000s of them, right? So why are they all like worth so many millions? I don't know. Isn't there like a difference between like, you know, these well, are not rare it somehow. It's relative too. Uh, because it's not like, a, like, like gold, you know, that you cannot find it in the, gro in the ground or something like this, you know? Well, but I mean, it's, it is scarce in the sense that there are only a few projects, let's say in Ethereum 2017. So the CryptoPunks are 10,000, but they're the only 10,000 all the time. So when there are millions and millions, it is scarce, but yeah. it is on a manufacturer's thing. Yeah. I think digital, this makes no sense. We should actually push for abundance for a completely different system. Yeah. Actually, the board apes are yeah, worth millions, but you can get one, like probably you can find one on the floor here. Someone's going to drop a seed phrase anytime soon. I'm looking at like maybe there's hoodies around. Guys, someone has a seed phrase. So, you know, millions is relative. You can get it for yeah. five USD maybe, yeah. if you're clever. Uh, that actually brings us to, I think, what might, can, I, can people hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I think that brings us to what could be an interesting uh, sort of closing question, um, especially picking up on, you know, your last sentiment there, which is that what is one dimension of the NFT ecosystem as it exists today that as people who were around in, you know, 2017, around the origin of the non-fungible token, you would change to make it truer everything. to your intentions from that everything. moment? Everything. <laughs> Just one thing. <laughs> everything. That's if, one. You, if, you, if you had to articulate one, one dimension that really needs overhaul. What would you pick? Okay, so, so we, again, we, when CryptoKitties launched after us, 
and the whole thing exploded. Uh, we did this uh, Rare Art Fest in January 2018. I was one of the keynotes there. That night, they sold, I think, Homer Pepe uh, in an auction for like $38,000 back then. We had seen kitties being sold for over 100000 uh, before the, the, the Homer Pepe. All the New York Times, the Paris Review, everybody reviewed the thing, and they only talked about the sale. And so for me, at that moment, was the moment that we said, we're, we're out of here. We're going to focus on uh, creating a different e economy, because it was very clear that the space was just replicating what the, what the, crypto, the, the cryptocurrencies were doing, which was this extreme speculation. And uh, we saw that as a threat to a community. And so back then, we went into a completely different direction. A market emerged. I will, like, what's wrong? The market. <laughs> For me, it's the market. So we're doing something completely different. For anyone here who wants to know what we're doing, it's the invisible economy. I'm going to talk about it tomorrow at 10.30. I think it's in this stage, so that I don't get into that. But I would, I mean, if people who participate in the market are doing well in the market, that's great. The problem is the narrative to say that it is actually democratizing and good for all artists. See the actual data. We're talking about what markets are. It's a star system. It's few people capturing most of the value and a long tail of people trying and spending a lot of money trying to make an, you know, some kind of living out of it. It's a lie. And so that is important to know because if you do well, that's great for you. But it's not true that 90% you know, of people are actually not selling, at, at least artists, right? So that's very important to, I think, to point out. Um, I think what we used to focus on a lot was provenance. And I think provenance, there is like so much more things to explore. And, and you know, the blockchain keeps everything around, for, at least for now. Uh, it's immutable, so, you know, there's traces everywhere. So I think what will become interesting, and maybe it should also become interesting, is like more innovation on the provenance aspect yes. and, and kind of I, I think as software developer, we have created a very nice system for us with Git and kind of being able to yeah. track like everyone's work in this like master tree of all the Git branches and everything um, to, to us. And I think f speaking for us, like we are doing kind of well. And I want like this, like pr applying this kind of principle of of, of provenance, I think, to the art world or in general to the media creation world, you know, be it music or graphics or wh whatever, video. I think this, I think, in general, if we would build more um, uh, tools towards uh, proper attribution online, I think this, uh, this can have a positive impact, in my opinion. Yeah, and uh, I agree with everything that Tim says, first and foremost. Um, <laughs> Uh, provenance is one of the things that I'm very excited to to see. Um, especially, you know, we're we're also building infrastructure for provenance, a JPEG. You know, we're building registries so that people can create a community source and less biased ways to discover NFTs. We're building exhibitions so that you know there's more uh, there's more extensibility of this like uh, unidimensional provenance that there's right now between you know the passage of hands from a collector to the other. And I'm also very excited beyond, you know, uh, being a person that, uh, you know, likes markets and provenance and uh, whatnot. And of course, you know, experimenting with the NFT as a medium. I'm very excited about uh, how can we create um, the creative classes that are uh, supporting, in, you know, let's say uh, I'm going to use the art world example again, but, you know, we should create new ones. You know, where are the critics? Uh, where are the marketers? Where are the communicators? Where are the historians? And where are the curators as well? So all of those different roles that will give uh, jobs to people, um, I'm very excited about creating them as well. It gives us a lot to look forward to, I'd say. Yeah. Um, and also a lot of work to be done yet. So to that I say, it's time to build. <laughs> 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 oh. um, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs>